The anatomy of the human face is complex, made even more so by the variations we see between people of different ages, sexes and ethnicities, to name a few. However, despite this, we as scientists can make many generalisations based on common morphological features that can aid us when describing the face and ultimately when carrying out clinical procedures relating to it. Today we're going to explore the detailed surface anatomy of the face from a surgical perspective. My name is Dr Connor Boylan and welcome to Anatomy 101. Let's start by generating an overview of the regions of the face before we delve deeper. The most superior part of the face, bounded along its upper border by the hairline and in the middle by the tracheon, is the forehead, sometimes called the frontal region. You may also see the temporal regions labelled either side of the forehead. Below the forehead we have the eye, or orbital region, and the nose, or nasal region. Continuing downwards, we have the mouth, or oral region, followed by the chin, or mental region. Lastly, either side of the mouth, we have the two cheeks. The cheeks, depending on your textbook, are sometimes further subdivided into infraorbital, or below eye, zygomatic, buccal, and parotid regions. Okay, now we're familiar with the broad regions of the face, let's look more closely at some points of interest beginning with the nose. The nose is of particular interest to plastic and reconstructive surgeons as it forms an integral part of our outward appearance. It's also a very common place to operate, either due to trauma, which is very common here, or due to the high prevalence of skin pathologies such as cancer. Let's start at the top of the nose and work downwards. Take your finger and place it on the inner part of one of your eyebrows. Now move your finger towards the midline. You'll notice what feels like a rounded protrusion directly between your eyebrows that slants inwards as you move inferiorly. The area just above this part is known as the glabella, which is named for the Latin word glaber, which means smooth. And the area just below this is known as the nasal root. Clinically, the term nasal root is usually enough to describe this region, but anatomists may further divide the region into the nasion, celion, and rhinion. The nasion is the midline point overlying where the frontal and nasal bones meet. The cellion is the midline point where the nasal root curves inward maximally. It derives its name from the Latin word for saddle due to its shape. And the rhinion is the lowest midline part of the nasal root where the bony part of the nose ends and the cartilaginous part begins. Now move your finger downwards from the glabella and see if you can identify the regions we've just talked about. You might see the term nasal bridge to describe this approximate region, but I personally prefer nasal root as it's a little more clear what you're describing. Okay, now continue to move your finger inferiorly and we'll come to the next part of the nose. This large portion that goes from the rhinion to the tip is known as the nasal dorsum, or sometimes nasal ridge. Directly inferior to this is the fleshy nasal tip which is usually the part of the nose projecting furthest out from the plane of the face. If we move our finger laterally from the tip, we'll come to two soft tissue walls that enclose the nares, or nostrils. These are known as the nasal ala, whose name comes from the Latin word for wing. If we put our finger back on the tip of the nose and instead move inferiorly, we'll come to a band of tissue that runs directly between the nares, separating them in the midline. This is known as the columella, due to its column-like shape. The last part of the nose we should be aware of are the two nasal sidewalls, which form the sides of the nose from the start of the eyebrows to the start of the ala. The part where the nasal sidewall merges with the medial cheek is known as the nasofacial sulcus, and the part where the ala join the cheek is the alofacial sulcus. Alright, that's the surface anatomy of the nose. Quite a lot to take in, so feel free to pause and rewind to go through that again if you think it'll help. Okay, let's continue our journey down the midline face to the oral region. The first thing you'll notice are the two obvious features that we usually call our lips. These are in fact together known as the vermilion. The upper lip actually consists of the upper vermilion and the cutaneous tissue inferior to the nose. And the lower lip consists of the lower vermilion 
and the cutaneous tissue down to the mentolabial fold. In the upper lip, you may notice these two small ridges running bilaterally from the inner part of your nares to the vermilion cutaneous border. These are known as the filtral ridges, which run either side of the midline filtrum. You should be able to feel these pretty easily, unless you've got a moustache. The origins of the word philtrum are a little hazy, but they seem to relate to the ancient Greek philtron, which literally means love charm. This is probably related to the obvious romantic connotations of the lips, and also helps to explain another term we'll use later. The little dip right at the bottom of the philtrum is our philtral dimple. And then we have my favourite anatomical term in the face, the cupid's bow. It describes the kind of M-shaped part of the upper lip where it joins the philtrum. Cupid was a Roman god of love, and the region is shaped sort of like a bow, hence its name. The last parts of the oral region to be aware of are the corners of the mouth, properly known as the left and right oral commissures, the melolabial folds, which are these creases either side of the mouth better seen when smiling, and the apical triangle, which is a portion of skin between the lateral cutaneous upper lip and the ala. Okay, we're getting there. The last complex part of the facial anatomy is the eyes, or orbital region. Obviously, there's a lot of detail we can go into regarding the eyes, but today we're just going to be covering their surface anatomy. We call the opening between the eyelids the palpebral fissure, where palpebra comes from the Latin word to flutter quickly. Clearly bordering this, we had the superior and inferior eyelids. Medially, we had the medial canthus, or medial palpebral commissure, and laterally, we have the lateral canthus, or lateral palpebral commissure. On the medial aspect of the eyelids, we have the upper and lower puncta, through which tears drain into the eye during lacrimation. Then of course we have the eyelashes, more properly known as the cilia, which emerge from both eyelids to protrude anteriorly and protect the eye from debris. Looking inside the palpebral fissure, we have the components of the orbit, or eyeball. The white part is known as the sclera, the coloured part the iris, and the central opening for light, the pupil. The transparent part of the sclera that covers the iris and pupil is known as the cornea, and this meets the true sclera at a border known as the limbus. Lastly, this fleshy pink bit in your medial eye is known as the plica semilunaris. The name means crescent-shaped fold in Latin, and is thought to be a vestigial remnant of the nictitating membrane or third eyelid that is seen in animals such as birds, reptiles, and amphibians. In the most medial part of the eye is the lacrimal caruncle, which consists of accessory lacrimal tissue. Lastly, there are several recognisable creases around the eye, known as the superior eyelid crease, the inferior eyelid crease, the malar fold, and the nasojugal fold. And there we go. That's all of the surface anatomy of the face that we think you should know. If you found this video useful, remember to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future uploads. If you wanted to learn more about the anatomy of the head and neck, including the ears, we have loads more videos in our collection. Check out this playlist to get started. But for now, that's all I have to say. I hope you learned something, and have a great day.